Thank you so much. Um, this uh, presentation really wraps up the sessions today. It has two functions. One, it's a transitional presentation <coughs> linking what we've been talking about today with some of the sessions we'll hear tomorrow. So looking at presentation as well as, as capture and measurement. But also, it's the local interest piece as we, we draw to the end of, of today. This is um, a presentation that looks at the, the near Lewis Hoard. So this is um, a, a Middle Bronze Age um, find that was uh, recovered um, four or five years ago um, near the county town of Lewis, which is about eight miles east of us, I think that way. The reason I'm gesticulating wildly is I don't know the orientation of this room, um, but I'm assuming this way. Um, it was found on a hilltop uh, in a, a ceramic uh, vessel. Um, it's a hugely important archaeological find. And what we're going to talk about today is the, the process that we went through in capturing that particular um, uh, find or group of finds um, in 3D and presenting them <coughs> to the public. So um, as I alluded to earlier, the, the hoard is of Middle Bronze Age date. Looking at the, the artifacts within it, um, they date to between 1400 BC and uh, 1250 BC. I'm putting my money on about 1300 BC. Um, it's part, the, the deposition occurred as part of what's known as the ornament horizon. So this is um, a feature of the, the Middle Bronze Age. Um, very common in the south of England where we see uh, hordes of this nature uh, being deposited. Um, and these hordes, these ornament hordes often contain um, material that seems to relate to ornamentation, so um, ornaments of the, the hands, the arms, um, and uh, clothing decoration. Um, the thing that makes the Near Lewis Hoard quite special is the fact that it has quite a number of exotic foreign uh, imports in it, plus um, lots of evidence of um, artefacts that indicate very close local identities. So what I'm going to quickly do before we talk about the, the 3D acquisition, I'll just talk about the, the discovery. Uh, it was discovered by a metal detectorist in 2011. Unusually, he took photographs of the, the process of him uh, actually excavating the, um, the hoard uh, in situ. So here we see the ceramic vessel. We can start to see the emergence of some bracelets. Um, as he digs further, we can see the emergence of um, um, gold uh, applique discs. We've got pins um, and um, necklaces. As he goes further down, we start to see uh, far more detail emerging. And then we have these rather unusual um, monk's wood ornaments. We have no clue quite what they are. And right at the base of this, this deposit, we have these uh, four Sussex loops. So these are uh, bracelets that appear to have been produced very locally, somewhere between Brighton uh, and Lewis. That's where the majority of these uh, bracelets have been found. And here is the ceramic vessel. As you can see, it's been sheared off um, by, by the plough. Um, the metal detectorist was um, very good. He reported the find to the Port of Antiquities scheme, and immediately a, a team was sent to excavate the site in more detail. Um, and this is what they found. So here is the chalk cut pit into which the uh, the hoard was deposited, but also you can see um, at the top of the excavation here um, what appears to be maybe the terminal of a ditch or something similar. Um, we intend to do geophysics to try and ascertain what this is. 
So in terms of our artifacts, we've got five Sussex loops, um, three pal staves, uh, eight finger rings, <coughs> four gold applique uh, discs. We've got a number of twisted torques uh, and some of these quoit headed pins and lozenge headed pins, and necklaces with amber beads. Um, quite an exotic assemblage. In total, there were 79 fragments and complete objects. And there's a complete list thereof. Um, that's a detail of one of these Sussex loops. Um, they seem to have been produced in pairs. And this is one of a, a pair, um, a black and white image of the top and bottom, <laughs> spiral finger ring. There are eight of these, twisted torque. Um, if anybody is interested, we have a replica of the talk. <laughs> so that was a real thing. That wasn't 3D printed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. He wants it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, as with most Bronze Age hordes, you get your usual uh, pal staves or socketed axes. In this particular case, we've got three pal staves. Um, and these spiral necklaces. Thankfully, um, when, the, when the detectorist actually photographed the, the process of, of excavating the, the hoard, uh, he took this photograph so we can actually determine that the, um, the amber beads were part of this this spiral necklace, we can actually see how they were situated. And here's some photographs of that cleaned up. These are some of your amber beads, and again, the amber is significant. One way or the other, that amber has travelled from the Baltic. Um, so it is a significant um, component of this hoard. Um, we've also got small beads like this one, this rather grotty ceramic bead um, was actually of the same material as the, the ceramic vessel in which the hoard was contained, which is interesting. And of course the star of the, the, uh, the hoard are these four gold applique discs. Um, unusual because they haven't been found in this country before, where they have been found is the south of France and central France. So again, potentially indicating long-term or long-range um, links. So today we're going to be looking at the acquisition, the 3D acquisition um, of this hoard. Um, in terms of thinking about acquiring um, any object or artifact in 3D, you've got a number of choices. In terms of your choice of equipment, that is determined by what is available to you. It's a very obvious statement. Um, we are lucky, the Cultural Informatics Research Group has been uh, involved in digitization in 3D for the last decade, so we've got access to um, just about every kind of 3D scanning uh, equipment that is available, but not every organisation necessarily has access to uh, various types of equipment. So that, that's, a, that's a limiting factor. Um, you also need to consider the properties of the items that you intend to scan, the optical properties. What is the best equipment that can be used to acquire um, those, those objects? And also you need to think about the aims. Why, why do you want to do this, this uh, acquisition? Now we had two distinct uh, aims. We wanted, um, with the Sussex Archaeological Society who, who owned the, the, the hoard, uh, we wanted to present it to the public. So that was our, our sort of primary aim. But we also wanted um, some research output. We wanted to start to create a, a data set of similar objects. We wanted to compare them in 3D. So that was, that was another um, research aim in the background. 
The key point, though, is obviously if you are going to actually undertake 3D acquisition, you should do it in the highest quality possible, the highest resolution. The reason I say that is that it, it takes time and resource to actually scan something. We're all aware of um, the fact that the actual process of scanning takes time. So here's um, the results of some work we did in the 3D Coform project. Um, this is uh, research undertaken at the VNA. Um, and you can see a variety of different objects, um, different material types. And you can see the, the, the red bar indicates the actual scan time and the, the green bar indicates the post-processing time. <coughs> so it's the combination of those two elements that really make up the time of, of scanning. Now we're all aware of that. The thing is there are two other components that we are less well aware of, and that is object preparation. So actually getting the object from store to your place of scanning and object return. And it doesn't matter what you do with your digitization in terms of condensing that workflow maybe, you still got those, those times there. So scanning objects is resource intensive. So if you're going to do it, then do it to the highest quality possible. Now, in terms of our hoard, our Leo Lewis hoard, we had a range of artifact types, as we've alluded to earlier. So we've got bronze. Now, bronze sounds like a homogenous entity, but it's not. In terms of this hoard, um, we had patinated bronze. We had highly corroded bronze. And we had nice and shiny bronze, often in the same artifact. And that makes really interesting scanning. I can tell you. Um, we also had ceramics, much easier to scan. We had amber, we had um, 26 of these amber beads. Now the thing about amber, as you know, in the ground, it oxidizes. It can go quite crumbly, it's uh, a bit of a difficult material to handle, but sometimes it can be preserved well um, and you can still retain the translucency. So in some cases we had, um, we were dealing with material that was almost like ceramic and in others we were dealing with a, a sort of glassy material. So again, complexity is there. And of course gold, shiny, shiny, not good for scanning. Um, also we had artifacts that ranged in size from about seven mil to 20 to 30 centimeters. Um, also, we had objects that were, for example, like this, this loop here, definitely three-dimensional. Um, but if you can visualize that, that gold disc, that was far more flat. So again, different scanning tools um, could be applied to those, those different scenarios. And here's just a sort of visualization of the, the sorts of difficulties you can have with, or increasing difficulties with different materials. So stone is usually a re relatively easy material to scan. Once you get to shiny and transparent materials, they start to get far, far more interesting. Um, and obviously, um, it's the optical complexity <coughs> that uh, really makes this problematic and limitation of the sensors. So in terms of the options available to us, we, we have laser scanning available, structured light scanners available, um, dome-based de um, devices, so RTI, um, and we could use photogrammetry. Um, we, in the end, decided to use uh, a combination of structured light scanning using a Breutmann uh, structured light scanner um, for the sorts of objects like this with the um, dome-based scanner for the flatter objects like the, the gold applique discs. 
here we are at the British Museum with actually the gold disc on screen to prove that we are actually scanning it. So in terms of uh, presentation, we wanted to um, present this material to the public. So we worked with um, the Sussex Archaeological Society, Sussex Past, um, to create this touchscreen display which uh, will be housed at uh, the Barbican House in Lewis, um, eventually aiming for an on online site. But we also wanted to create uh, a handling collection. Um, so 3D prints were considered for this, but also physical replicas, one of which is going around now. Um, so in terms of, of how we, um, we created our presentation, we, we created our, um, our 3D mesh, and we wrapped high resolution photographic <coughs> images over that, that mesh to give us a very high quality uh, end result. This is not an example of that though. Um, in terms of, for example, our um, spiral necklace where we've got multiple parts. Uh, so we've got amber beads, we've got the um, various bits of the, the necklace itself. Uh, we scanned the parts individually and then reassembled them um, in mesh lab. Uh, like this. Um, and again, this is um, just a mesh lab visualization um, of one of these Sussex loops. Here's a spiral twisted uh, fingering. Um, in terms of our um, visualization of the um, gold applique discs, that was acquired using the RTI uh, scanning technique. So in terms of the touch screen, we could allow the user to manipulate the light with their finger. So you could change the direction uh, of the light. It's proved to be a very, very attractive uh, technique. Um, we also uh, created a number of uh, 3D prints now these were aimed at uh, for the handling collection, but also we used those 3D prints to create moulds from which we could then create actual replicas. So again, another way of thinking about uh, creating handling collections without the need for actually touching, as it were, the original objects. I'll pass these around in a in a moment. Um, in terms of the issues, um, two things we did notice um, <coughs> in terms of um, display technology, you really need robust hardware. School children can run riot with, with computer equipment. So, you know, you need good, high quality, robust hardware. Um, we also noticed that um, having two different mechanisms for manipulating the object, so the, the RTI display and the manipulation of the, the 3D models on screen, did cause a little bit of confusion um, with, the, with the users. Um, so conclusions, and I've gone for conclusions that relate not so much to the, um, to the actual acquisition itself, but I've gone big, looking at some of the, the, the sort of results that we've, we've come across over the, the years. Um, funding, obviously we, we've seen that, that there are inherent costs with 3D acquisition. Um, it can be expensive and the sector is short of money. Um, organizations wishing to engage in 3D acquisition need to really view it from quite a strategic perspective. Um, we also find that the size of organizations seems to be quite a, a feature in terms of who is engaging with um, 3D acquisition. Um, it's important because obviously with the smaller organizations of which there are a huge number across Europe engaging in heritage, 
um, they often don't have the skill set even today. Um, and obviously, in terms of equipment, in terms of the more sophisticated scanning equipment, um, most heritage sites do not have access. However, photogrammetry is proving to be very popular and it could be a way forward. Um, and on that note, I'd like to finish. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.